Well, thank you very much, uh, Michalis. And um, as I see quite a few young people here, I will tell you uh, a very sad story. Don't believe that politicians can anticipate. Politics is very often reactive. I would say 90% of politics is reactive. It's very unfortunate. You're very clever. You read all the stuff in universities. You think you can foresee, and you can, but even if you can foresee, if the political system doesn't feel the pressure, nothing happens. Now, the good news is that sometimes then we do react. And when the migrants were moving on the motorways in my country, Denmark, which I had long forgotten, then people understood that something was going on in Syria, in other places like that. When uh, the refugees poured into the Baker Valley and then started buying boats uh, to go over the Aegean, then we actually pulled ourselves together and started to establish a certain number of measures. But it's very frustrating, I have to say, that we always act after the fact. It's very frustrating that I had conversations with Fuad Oktay in Ankara begging me to finance Turkish reception of refugees for a year before the pressure became such that the three uh, billion euros were mobilized and put at the disposal of our Turkish friends. And I say friends because you do a, an amazing job for, for all of us and uh, with doubtful uh, morality. It is very frustrating that 10 years ago, when we had the enlargement with our dear Polish friends and the Slovaks and uh, all the other countries, and I had a conversation with the German Ministry of Interior, and I said, congratulations, Glückwunsch, Glückwunsch for you. Now you can abolish your Bundesgrenzschutz. 250 people in uniform that guard your border, you just abolish it and you transfer it to a European border control agency. They looked at me like I was crazy. Ah, so we have to abolish that. I said, yes, because you don't have any external border anymore. Why do you have a Grenzschutz? What, what does this, no, it doesn't make sense. No, no, no. We have orchestras, we have uh, uh, summer camps for our children, uh, they have uniforms, they, they love that. Now they have been folded into the Bundespolizei, but it took uh, seven or eight years to get rid of all this nonsense. And meanwhile, we forgot to build up Frontex. We gave it a little bit of money, but when the migration and the terrorists came, we were under-equipped. But let's be grateful for this crisis, just like the Euro crisis, that it pushes us to take a number of initiatives and put the house in order. And let's be happy that it has not completely blown up the European Union. I'm not a, a, a defeatist, but I think uh, the fact that we had to put uh, the whole of Schengen on halt because the free movement suddenly was questioned is deeply worrying. So it shows that we have to anticipate as best as we can, and when the right moment is there, we have to run and fix it and make sure it happens. Now, I want to come back to um, the longer term, because let's be honest with each other. This is just the beginning. From now until 2060, there will be two billion babies born in Africa. The continent is exploding. Even in the best of cases, these people will not have jobs, they will not have a future, they will be full of very intelligent young men and women that simply are desperate for a future. And some of them, just a small percentage, they will walk. And if they won't walk, they will buy a a four-wheel truck from some smugglers, and they will come. So we have to come to grips with this situation. And we have now got the warning from the Syria crisis, which, by the way, you mentioned climate, partly was triggered by drought in the southern part of Syria. I mean, they are very uh, different ideas. It's not only politics. It's also the fight for resources, for agricultural produce, for 
food, for uh, uh, minerals and so on that are driving all of this. So we have to be aware that it's, it's, it's tectonic plates that are moving underneath that will push these people towards a depopulated European continent. In 2015, we reached in Europe the trigger point of actually zero, slightly negative population growth. In the next 30 years, we will lose 30 million Europeans. We will go from half a billion to 470, 465 million Europeans. How the hell are we going to fill that gap? How are we going to be prepared to actually uh, get some productive people into our economy if we don't have a good integration policy, if we don't have a, a reception mechanism that actually lives up to our wishes of preserving our societies? So it's full of challenges for you youngsters that sit here because you're going to take over. I will be on holiday or in, <laughs> in paradise or somewhere else looking at you that you do the right thing. And um, <clears throat> just, just on a few specifics, uh, it's amazing actually. Uh, Ruby mentioned uh, a lot of the new tools on the uh, uh, asylum side and uh, we have a new agency on Coast Guard and Border Control. The SOFIA operation, the patrolling uh, in the Mediterranean has taken shape. All of that will feed into the new defense identity of the European Union, because now people understand that we better act together. We cannot sit there and just have our military work in different formats, etc., etc., under NATO, but because NATO is very good, but it's not sufficient. We need something. We are very lucky, I shouldn't say so because I love the Brits, but we are very lucky that they leave the Union because they were blocking the use of the European brigades in Mali and in the Central African Republic, so that when we had problems down there, the French had to move around and ask, could you please help us, etc., and we couldn't use the tool that we had. So we have to fix that. And we have to stop running our individual 27 development policies in all the different parts of Sub-Saharan Africa. I don't like to say it, but when I'm with my compatriots, because now I'm hosted in the Danish uh, embassy in, in Brussels, and they are so proud of their little Danish program, and I say, have you coordinated with the French? Have you coordinated with the Germans? Have you folded it into a plan? And they say, well, no, but our minister really wants to do something nice. I said, okay, good luck, but make sure that it fits, because we are creating confusion with our plans in Bangui or in Bamako or in Ouagadougou, because these poor people cannot cope with 27 donors that are coming in airplanes <laughs> with consultants and all of that crap. So put it together, coordinate your policy. And this is happening right now, because with the Valletta program, with a meeting that Macron called in Saint Cloud, they recognized, we all recognized that we have to coordinate this much better. By the way, we should do it also with the Canadians and what is left of American uh, uh, foreign, foreign policy or whatever they have over there. So, so there is a huge window of opportunity that is just as big as fixing the euro, which also has taken strides forward. So I, I, think, I think, I mean, if we have to look back, and, and, and my heart is crying for the Syrians and all of that, but you should never waste a good crisis. Get going. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, now, the, 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 the speakers and uh, I remember yesterday there was here um, an Austrian guy in a panel in, for digital strategy, and he said, he started speaking it, he said, what are you doing here? This is a failure. What, what, what kind of forum is this? We are not interacting. We shouldn't speak here 10 minutes each, and uh, then we don't have a space. We don't, we don't discuss anymore. So he was very, very aggressive. Of course, he spoke for 10 minutes himself as well, but <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter. Now, we have, I think we have uh, exactly half an hour for a discussion. And so please, I don't want to speak more, please, um, uh, questions. Sorry. Uh, 
Um, my name is Dmitry Bechev. I'm at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Uh, thanks, everyone, for the most uh, fascinating panel. I have a question regarding uh, legal migration. Um, of course, most of the discussion is about irregular migration or about asylum seekers and refugees. But I do remember when Sarkozy was around, he had ideas about the European scheme to encourage um, some sort of arrangement uh, akin to the green card in, in the US. He called it the blue card. Is it too naive to think there is political space in Europe to have some sort of a pan-European cooperation scheme? Or is it just the DH has changed now? I mean, of course, also in, in the US now with the Trump administration, there is a debate about changing uh, legal migration as well with um, chain migration and um, maybe emulating the Canadian and Australian system. So it's a global thing. But uh, coming back to Europe, um, do you think there is political momentum to upgrade uh, the common migration policy? Um. <coughs> At the beginning, we were talking, and I said, OK, Europe is having two policies until now. It should have a third policy, which is the facilitation, a common policy for legal migration, because we need all these people. We need to replace the 30 million, and we need to add more people in Europe in order to, to make our growth sustainable, which is actually uh, the growth challenge that we have to talk about. Uh, definitely. We don't have. And actually, yeah, Brussels have been very uh, reactive to the policies, uh, to, to, to the crisis, and uh, actually very ill-prepared. In Greece, we have uh, realized that the, this wave of 2015 was coming from 2013. We went we, out and we cried for help. And we said, let's do something. And it, we were alone with Malta and a little bit of Italy. And that was it. <laughs> Nobody was listening. Uh, when we were establishing the first hotspot in Mytilene, in Lesbos, in 2013, uh, the commissioner Malmström, who was responsible at the time, paid a visit. I was struggling to, as a minister of the AG and, and responsible for the Coast Guard, I was struggling to, to keep our boats out in the water, patrolling, saving lives, and also guarding the sea border. But we had such budget constraints, I didn't have enough money to buy gas and, uh, and fuel. And um, <coughs> Mrs. Malmstrom was asking me whether I was providing dental care daily to the refugees coming into Greece. And I said, I, did, I don't have money to run my boats. And you are asking me to bring dentists? Are you crazy? <coughs> they were so out of context. And only after 2015, something that really was expected to happen, we cried for help before. Nobody really listened. And after 2015, OK, we have a billion to deal with this uh, issue. Is this billion is really directed rightly? You were talking about municipalities and how municipalities have to play a key role. They are the one hosting the refugees and the migrants. You know that municipalities and regions are excluded for EU, from EU financing. It's so crazy. We can have the Norwegian Council of Refugees working in Mytilene, but the, the, uh, the uh, municipality of Lesbos, and it's directly financed from Brussels, and it's bringing people who are uh, paid in Norwegian salaries to work on the Greek islands, imagine which is uh, what is what. But the town of the city of uh, Mytilene is not getting any, uh, one euro of financing, although it has to collect the garbage. It has like 8,000 people more living in the area, has to be infrastructure, has hospitals that has 
uh, to expand even a cemetery. Even a cemetery. And I always believe that it's, it's so short-sighted the way that we're talking. And um, uh, actually, populism uh, on this issue has been uh, overplayed. At the recent German elections, people that voted for the ultra-right party that was anti-immigration, uh, the most of the votes were coming in the areas that had the least of refugee and migrants. And uh, we have to deal directly to this issue uh, in, in terms of economic growth. And this is, uh, this is my thesis. I mean, for the future to come. And even in Greece, we have people, uh, you know, in the Greek islands, a lot, thousands of people, 10, 10 12,000 of people blocked in, on the islands. And another 50, 60,000 people blocked in camps in Greece. And we have thousands, hundreds of villages underpopulated, empty houses, empty infrastructures, empty schools <coughs> that we could host people. And we are not doing a proactive policy in order to fill the gaps, to use the people that have uh, come into Greece. Uh, I know they are not skilled workers. You can't put them in the industry directly. You can't put them, uh, you know, in high-tech business. But in agricultural business, in farming, this is an easy, uh, easy thing to do. Well, sorry, uh, well, I, said I made the second round of uh, thoughts, uh, I think. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your patience. Uh, just, uh, just a few words on the blue, on the blue card scheme. I mean, uh, the proposal is on the table. There has been, uh, 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 the job has been done from the side of the commission. It's over there with the member states. And it actually uh, is, a, in my view, a very important component in managing even the illegal migration. Why? Because if you put yourself in the shoes of a prime minister in Niger or Mali, you would want to have a discussion with these Europeans up there about how, because we come and ask them to manage the migration and to take care of the smugglers network, etc., etc., but they want a quid pro quo. They want development assistance that is well coordinated. I spoke about that a moment ago. But they also want to send some of their own people to Europe in a very legal way. And that's where the blue card comes in, that we actually say, OK, we will take some of your guys if they have been you know, on university or this and that. It's not very moral. It's a, a little bit of a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a marketplace here. And so it serves a purpose to fill the gap we have, which, where we need people, but it also serves a political purpose in our interaction with these people. This being said, the blue card scheme will never ever be so huge that it will deal with the total pressure of migration. We are talking about completely different numbers. I spoke about millions of people just a moment ago, and blue card, I mean, it's maybe 30,000 or 40,000 or 100,000, God knows what. And first of all, it has to be adopted. Just one word on, uh, on the situation in the Aegean, because I happen to be heavily involved in that. In the first proposals that we actually put to member states and uh, discussed, uh, we had a direct support system for the municipalities. But it was not accepted, partly because of fears of mismanagement. I mean, we had very nasty discussions about the capacity of the central government, of the ministry, to cope and of what goes on in the, uh, in the municipalities. I'm, I'm very sorry for that. I'm really very sorry. But it shows the need for public sector reform. It actually underlines what has been running through this whole seminar for the last three days, that public sector reform, efficiency, accountability, all of that is essential because the best thing to do is to work through the government. It's clear. It's clear. And this is, by the way, what we do in Turkey uh, because we, 
the three billion euros are actually linked to the social budget of your Ministry of Social Affairs. So we come in, we put money up there, we say this is how it has to be organized, and the Ministry of Social Affairs in Ankara is helping us to distribute, and the UNHCR is our agent uh, to do that. But you should, especially in urban settings, you have to work with the municipalities, otherwise it doesn't work. And also in Mitilini, it's, it's clear. So we have things to learn from, from each other. Romolo Gandolfo from College here in Athens. Um, at the panel a couple of days ago about Russia and the West and the Western Europe, I was very much struck by a comment of one of the two Russian speakers who at some point presented Russia as the only, as a country which is defending European liberal values which have been forgotten by Angela Merkel's, uh, Merkel and other liberal uh, European leaders. And that was clearly framed in an anti-Muslim uh, context. Uh, and since now we see this difficulty, great difficulty, in Eastern European countries like Poland, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary, even though Hungary is, in my view, a different case because they have a per capita ratio of asylum seeker, seekers, which is even higher than Germany. So uh, it's easy to talk bad about Orban because of his uh, illiberal model of democracy. But anyway, all these countries that used to be uh, very close to uh, the Soviet Union are now apparently reasoning, along with Russia, on Christian values and saying we are defending the Christian nature of Europe. And that's why we don't want a single, one single uh, Muslim uh, refugee in our countries. This is the position which has been openly expressed by European leaders and this is creating a major fracture within the European Union. It's not just, I understand all these, you know, the concerns about our capabilities of integrating a large number of migrants, but not accepting a single one based on religion is a major threat to our common European values. And let's not forget that in Germany itself, most of the support for the uh, xenophobic, uh, alternative for Germany came from the eastern part of the country, which has received very few asylum seekers, whereas the western part of the country, which has received most of them, uh, you know, the, the far right is doing much. I mean, it's getting no more than six, seven percent of the vote. So the, all these are issues that somehow I would like to understand what's going on at the deeper level within Eastern Europe on issues like that. Well, one comment, one comment on Eastern Europe, one comment on Russia. First, let's deal with Eastern Europe. Uh, <clears throat> the historical experience of uh, being, uh, let's say, command economies, communist systems, uh, Soviet satellites. Uh, all these countries, including East Germany, became uh, on the one hand uh, ethnically very homogeneous because of the war, but also because of relative uh, close, uh, closeness of, the, of those countries. Those countries were unattractive for immigration. Uh, also, which probably outsiders don't understand that the communist regimes in uh, countries like Poland, but also in, in Germany to a lesser extent, 
had to turn nationalistic to gain some kind of legitimacy among the population. So, contrary to the, let's say, uh, proletarian internationalism, so to say, uh, communist regimes in Eastern Europe were very nationalistic. So the soil for today's problems was prepared. Now, comment on Russia. Well, it's an objective fact. It's a fact that Russia is, is uh, <coughs> receiving millions of uh, immigrants from its former, uh, let's say, <coughs> Soviet, uh, Soviet republics, uh, especially from, from Central Asia. They are quite populous. And, and of course, uh, I don't know what the Russian uh, participant uh, had in mind, but uh, maybe he could have in mind the fact that, well, Moscow is probably now the first Muslim city in Europe, bigger than <laughs> London, in terms of the, of, the popul of the Muslim population. And, well, he can say, we accept them. So, we... Uh, represent the uh, famous or proverbial, I don't know, Christian hospitality. I don't know what he had in mind. The problem is, or the difference is, that all those Muslim people from Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, and, and other stands, they speak Russian. They have been grown up in Russian culture, so the uh, well, the integration becomes, on this account, much easier. It's not uh, without problems, of course, all due respect to Russia, but they all speak Russian. But, uh, my understanding was that he was not praising Russian uh, hospitality, but pointing to the mm. Russian danger and saying you in Western Europe are blind the danger of Islamic Muslim migrants uh, and we often feel now that we have to keep alive the values of liberalism against the uh, extremism and the fundamentalism of uh, uh, Muslims. Of course, well then, then I, I, well, then he understands European values in a different way from what I, uh, okay. If I could just add a historical comment. Um, what strikes me is, again, the language of xenophobia and how today it is against a religious group and that this has become, but that historically there has always been a construction of fear and that fear changes at different times. In the middle of the 19th century in the United States, it was against Catholics. The anti-papist movement against Irish coming to the United States was fearsome. In France in the 1920s and 30s, there was great xenophobia against Italians and Poles, both of whom were Catholic, but didn't really meet the standards of the Gallic Catholic Church. Uh, Jews, all of the countries have had different groups come to them, different religious groups. Um, today, I think one of the problems is confusing religions with fundamentalist and terrorism. And it's that confusion which has made a, a stigma against Islam in general, which is, which is unfortunate and uncalled for. But it is, it's the fundamentalisms that are the problem. But the use of um, religion as the argument uh, in populist discourse um, is something which is, is created. And it, in the past, it's been created, and we can get over it. Because in the past, societies have gotten over it and have integrated people who come from different places, <clears throat> speak different languages, and have different religions. So. As a historian, I'm often pessimistic because I see recurrence of these forms of creation of different kinds of fear of the other. At the same time, over the long run, people get integrated and do settle in. Uh, but it takes a long time, and the current issues often take primacy over any longer-term perspective. But I think the longer-term perspective is necessary to keep in mind in order to relativize some of the discourses that we're hearing today. Thank <laughs> you. 
No, 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 I know what you mean. I, I, <laughs> I, I totally get what you mean, though, in terms of a, a, a blocker leaving the, yeah, blocker of moving forward, yeah. Uh, but I would just like to ask, in your opinion, uh, what role do you think this fear of the refugee crisis and this um, fear of being forced to take more refugees than they would like to take, what role that played in the Brexit referendum? Uh, obviously, we know that Nigel Farage uh, played upon it very much. And given that Britain now has a large Muslim population, I mean, as we all know, you go to East London, and it's like being in Muslim cities, literally, where they wear the the, the way, we'll, we'll be doing it in our classes as well. Uh, you see women walking around practically with burqas. So on the one hand, the British are used to, they are exposed to this sort of uh, Muslim attire, etc. On the other hand, are they, were they afraid of more refugees coming from these countries and that played? It's a little bit of a, a confusion because I can understand Hungary, Poland, Slovakia, they have not been exposed to this and they were scared right or wrong. The British have been exposed. Did that play in favor or against, if you know what I mean? It's like, no, we have enough already, or is it against, we don't want the EU telling us how many people to take? That's obviously an issue as well. Thank you. Uh, I mean, so. There is a lot of confusion that was created in the campaign, and obviously Farage and the other bastards, they took this issue and they, they increased it. They were just putting gasoline on the fire. Um, the paradox is that when we had the enlargement negotiations, some European countries actually uh, asked for a seven-year transition and they didn't open. Tony Blair was the one pushing and pushing and pushing uh, to open up. So they, they in fact created the ground for having, having, having tensions. But, but it's, uh, it's based on a, on a number of misconceptions because the polls that came in were liked by, by the population. They did a lot of very essential work in the uh, restaurant business, in agriculture, etc. And now they have the problem because now they go home and they cannot collect the vegetables in their, in their fields. And uh, they don't know who to, who to put in the hospitals because the nurses are going home. So it's, it's complete bollocks. Um, uh, I don't know. Um, they were accustomed to uh, large numbers of Commonwealth inflow, and there also there was a mix. It was not clear. A lot of Brits that I have spoken to, they didn't make the difference. They saw people with burqa on the street, and they thought that that is also the migration uh, challenge we are faced with, and if we go out, if we will Brexit, that would stop. But it, it's, it's just completely illogical, but it shows that having a referendum is super dangerous. I speak as a Dane. I know what I'm talking about. Okay, so just to add a couple of points then to, to Klaus's comments. Um, so with the two enlargements, the UK didn't have restrictions on intra-EU mobility, fine. But the... the so in the, in the Brexit debate, there were two things. There was the migrants from the, the EU citizens who were then competing for resources with the populations, which then kind of perfectly uh, connects with the theme of this year's economic forum, which is about new globalization and growth challenges. So the discussion finally the last decade has really engaged with the the fact that certain population groups in certain regions of the more developed economies have not benefited or have actually had a, a rough hit from the way globalization has shifted and the economy has shifted. So these population groups felt completely in competition with new EU migrants that just went in a very, very rapid, just population growth in a very small um, number of years. And then indeed, now the UK and Ireland and, and Sweden, actually Sweden didn't close the borders to this, but the UK has always had opt-outs and they've been able to use them fantastically so far. But Farage used the loss of control of borders. So then it was about sovereignty and this fantastic poster 
of just flows of them playing on all the nativist fears that have, again, in connection with what's happening with globalization and changes and shifts in identity and the, the disconnect between the local and the global and, and the shifts that are going on and that we're having to manage in our polarizing um, politicians. But actually, our polarizing societies, politicians are very apt at mobilizing these, these sentiments. Um, but the, the Brexit is putting another tension now to the other EU 27 member states on how to continue managing intra-EU mobility to the benefit then of all, including the UK. And there, people move, will continue to move across borders, regardless of the Brexit, thankfully, or not. Yeah, uh, I'd like to make just a couple of very quick uh, points. Uh, fear construction and the use of language to, to your point about Russia and defense of liberal values and uh, why is there a setback in Eastern uh, Europe. Uh, I, I think that fear construction is very much linked to the way, to the way politician elites use languages. And right now, the language that is used about Muslims kind of creates a very homogeneous uh, image of uh, Muslims and the hordes coming to descend. And that kind of language, humbly, I think, emerges in societies that begin to lose their liberal democratic characteristic. And uh, we have also learned <coughs> through what's been happening in the last couple of years in the US, but also in Europe, is, is that our assumption Klaus, the assumption of our generation that somehow liberal democracy was going to be a linear process. I think we were all conned by Fukuyama's theory, the end of history. And it kind of went like that until the, final, uh, the financial crisis of 2008. And from then on, we're beginning to see cracks and stress on liberal, uh, liberal democracy. The challenge, frankly, it's a big challenge uh, for the European Union, and uh, I hope United States can come out of the rut into which it has fallen in. You do need, you do need locomotives to drag along, and I think the EU did a brilliant job with enlargement. However, that exercise did not last long, long enough for the Western Germany, Eastern Germany difference to be bridged. And I see that in Turkey. The European Union, as a primary player, gives some credit to the US and also some to Turks. We experience a whiff of liberal democracy. And it was during that whiff of liberal democracy that Turkey turned from an emigration country, including asylum seekers, to an immigration uh, uh, country. But that whiff <coughs> disappeared. And now we are back to the hardest populist uh, kind of po uh, politics. I have no idea if Turkey is going to be able to come out from that rut. But I see a greater likelihood of Turkey coming out of that rut if a hand of engagement can be extended the way it was done in the 1990s. The difference between 90s and today is, is, is that the West, the, the defenders of liberal, the, the international liberal order are having problems. One last very quick point about those two billion babies that you're for, foreseeing. When I look at the globe and I say, where could I focus? for hope, and hope is Africa. Look at what South Africa did with Jacob Zuma. Look at finally Zimbabwe with Mugabe. Two years ago, Gambia. And if I was in that 10% of politics, I would really try to push this EU machinery and the, uh, the US to focus on the good developments in Africa so that you can turn around to the others and say, you know how Africa traditionally has always been treated as the trotten 
And if these things can happen in Africa, why not in Eastern Europe and why not in, in, uh, in Turkey as well? Last, last, municipalities. Municipalities work best with civil society and I, NGOs, I, I NGOs. And uh, we see that in Amman, we see that in Beirut, I wish we could see more of it in uh, Gaziantep, et, uh, et cetera. So civil society, talking about cause the youth, uh, it's mostly the youth that get, get engaged in, uh, in there and come up with projects that really help in a, in a minuscule manner, maybe very modest manner, but help with what the Global Compact on Refugees, one, one of the goals they want to achieve, uh, increasing the resilience of both refugees but also host societies, and let's not forget them. Thanks. Well, uh, we're coming to an end, I think. Uh, I don't know if somebody wants to, to add something from the table or if there is a very last question. No? So we are really on time. Thank you very much. I think it was very interesting, this discussion. And thank you all. Thank you.